<laughs> All right. So let's look at this. So why were we having the, the understand the context of in case some of you are feeling yeah. lost? What were well, the context of the entire long discussion on Tam versus Am? Maybe we can just put some colors here for the parts because we're not highlighting every aspect of um, oh, forget about it. We'll just leave it there. Uh, we can make it uh, we can put it in italics. So we had a long discussion on TAM versus uh, AM asset management. OK, why is that it's happening in the larger context of our survey of the financial services sector and the different types of firms that exist okay within that so having completed the tam versus am discussion we are going back to this and i'm just pointing out one little uh, aspect of this discussion on uh, depository financial intermediaries and uh, financial disintermediation so i'm just adding a little bit to your notes here so so the classical form of financial intermediation is provided by what type of institution Depository financial intermediaries, okay, banks, okay, and um, this I'm just adding to the idea of financial disintermediation here, okay. What I'm trying to say is that, okay, please in real life, please don't write disintermediation like this. I'm writing it like this only to sort of make it very clear that I'm talking about disintermediation, not intermediation. So don't write it like that in real life, okay. Okay, the classical form of financial, everybody understands now what is financial intermediation. The classical form of intermediary, the financial intermediary is the depository financial intermediary, right? And who are they? Banks. Banks, banks okay. So commercial banks, credit unions and all commercial co cooperative banks or whoever, okay. Everybody doing this depository financial intermediation business, okay. So the, when we talk about financial disintermediation, okay, the classical form of financial disintermediation therefore would be because the classical form of intermediation is the one done by the depository financial intermediaries, right? So when you're talking about the classical form of disintermediation, okay, the pure form of class financial disintermediation, it also has to be that type of disintermediation which knocks out the depository financial intermediary, all right? So it knocks out the banks. Let's take a simple example and use the banks, okay? So therefore, when you're talking about the classical form of financial disintermediation, because I've given you a broader definition, where whenever banks whenever actually not borrowers but they should be uh, because you're talking about um, the broader uh, uh, so it should be uh, fund raisers or uh, capital raisers or fu fund deficits and entities is a better way to refer to them um, did i use this term with you before Funds deficit entities bypass banks and raise direct finance because we are using the word stocks and bonds. So this is a loose way of using the word financial, uh, the expression financial disintermediation. Okay, this is not strictly correct. The strictly correct uh, classical form of financial disintermediation refers to the dis disintermediation of the, uh, I'm going to write it in kind of, uh, removing the banks as so it's not very well written i'll try to polish up the definition later but you understand what it is the classical form of financial disintermediation will refer to the process of knocking the banks out okay so when you're knocking the banks out what is the bread and butter business we have two bankers here who are joining uh, wholesale divisions of banks okay now uh, what is the classical what kind of finance do banks typically provide the bread and butter business of banks do they provide long-term finance or short-term finance oh, no. Both well, actually, that's not correct. The bread and butter business, the classical form of finance provided by commercial banks, is short term. It's typically working capital finance, which should liquidate within one year. Typically, they provide that's the kind of bread and butter business of banks. So, of course, banks have uh, very large banks have now moved into long term finance in the sense of syndicated loans and they do longer term syndicated loans. But that's why you notice that the reason that banks okay, the the f sort of um, where is that? Yeah, you notice that here that we have another category of financial institution here. NBFCs, microfinanciers, and what are TLIs? Term lending institutions, okay? So you have all these IFCI, IDBI, all these institutions which were set up earlier. Okay, these were actually meant to cater to the, so the classical perform function of the commercial banks has always been to provide short-term finance. Okay, 
and uh, that's why we had all these other uh, institutions like which were called the term lending institution term here is meant to be implicitly refers to long term <coughs> when we say term means actually what we are what we are implying is long term okay so that therefore to complement the uh, you know bank bank function of providing short term finance you also arrange for some term lending institutions to provide longer term finance in the more developed countries the longer term finance is just because the capital markets are more well developed they are raised uh, you raise long term funding through the capital markets by selling debt securities okay so essentially by selling bo what we call bonds okay bond markets and also that what has happened is where for the very large banks they have developed these syndicated loan teams where they uh, arrange syndicated loans for slightly longer terms uh, periods than one year okay but the classical bread and butter function of the bank has always been working capital finance that's why if you see prachi and solanki have been taken into working capital right business banking that's going to be working capital finance mainly mainly you're going to be dealing with working capital finance and all kinds of other non financial facilities like letters of credit okay uh, bank guarantees all these other kinds of uh, bank products okay so now um, so therefore what we are coming back to is to have a, a more uh, subtle and refined definition of uh, understanding of financial disintermediation is removing the banks as middlemen okay so now that you know that the classical function of the commercial bank has been to provide short term finance okay so if you are going to knock the middleman out okay knock the bank out what you have to do is you have to find some other way of getting short term finance not long term finance are you following what i'm saying yes sir yes. if the classical function of the bank the bread and butter business of the bank is to provide short term finance working capital finance okay against yes, inventories receivables etc okay so therefore when you're talking about a classical form of financial disintermediation it has to be some kind of activity that deprives the bank middleman of his bread and butter business are you following what i'm saying okay so what kind of instrument can you tell me i mean we've already discussed this instrument uh, therefore when when we are talking about disintermediation okay we're talking about disintermediation we are going to knock out the bank we are going to knock out the middleman and the fund deficit entity is going to go directly to the fund surplus entity through the capital markets okay but if you are going to knock out the bank what kind of instrument should you be selling debt yes debt, debt is not incorrect it's no what i'm trying to emphasize short is here finance. short term finance no, so what kind of can a corporation sell said treasury bills yes. uh, commercial papers commercial paper is the answer i was looking for okay so that's the answer so treasury bills can only be sold by the government treasury okay so the answer i was looking for is commercial paper okay i already told before you said short term finance i also said commercial okay i didn't hear you maybe he <laughs> drowned you he drowned you out okay but that's good so commercial paper is the answer i was looking for so therefore what i'm trying to emphasize here is that while people loosely refer to any kind of capital market issuance as financial disintermediation because you're raising money from directly from investors in the capital market and you're cutting out the middleman okay but the pure and the classical form of financial disintermediation is through the issuance of instruments like commercial paper okay because it has to be something by through which you're raising short term finance through the capital markets okay are you following but you are not convinced you understand why we are saying that because intermediation the classical form of inter financial intermediation is that provided by the depository financial intermediaries such as commercial banks okay and the bread and butter business of the commercial bank is to provide working capital finance okay which is short term in nature okay typically liquidating within a year so therefore to disintermediate the commercial banks whose bread and butter business is the provision of short term finance you have to find some way of raising short term finance through the capital markets are you following the logic now okay and the way you do that the most common instrument for doing that is commercial paper okay so you'll find as i mentioned to you that the more developed markets the more developed economies have very well developed capital markets so in the us markets you'll notice that most of the companies even those which have a half decent uh, name they would they would be raising a a huge amount of money through commercial paper so the us cp market is a massive market okay so which is why one of the one of the reasons why one of the uh, effects of the lehman bankruptcy was to freeze up the us cp market that's one of the reasons why and so us corporations even blue chip names like general electric 
I had trouble raising money through the CP market because the Lehman bankruptcy caused also so much disruption that the corporate CP market was also freezing up. And that's one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve jumped in with such, you know, uh, a sense of alarm and took such radical steps. So this is essentially, so what you have to understand is that if I ask you what is a classical form of financial disintermediation, okay, the correct answer would be the selling of commercial paper by, uh, you know, uh, any kind of corporation, typically a non-financial corporation, selling of commercial paper uh, uh, through the capital markets, okay, and which segment of the capital markets would you be selling commercial paper in, bond markets or money markets? Money markets. Money markets. Money markets. Everyone is clear about that, okay? Because, and so therefore, what are the features, what are, give me two distinctive features of commercial paper? Uh, yeah, but what? Less than one year and there is one Yeah, so the two distinctive features of commercial paper will be that the initial maturity will be less than one year and the coupon, there will be no coupon. It will be sold at a, dis it will be sold at a discount to face value. Okay, and what is the logic by which you work this? As I told you, your mental strategy. When you hear when you hear the word commercial paper, you will see that commercial paper. You will remember that commercial paper is a money market instrument. Then you'll go back to your definition of money markets and ca uh, bond markets, and you'll remember that money market instruments have uh, less than one year initial maturity, and then they have no coupon. They're sold at a discount to face value. So then you'll apply the general attributes of that category of instrument from money market instruments back to commercial paper, and then you'll say that commercial paper has initial maturity less than one year and is sold at a discount to face value has no coupon are you following this is how you should structure knowledge in your head okay then you'll have a general category and then you have individual members of that category so whenever you hear the name of an individual member you will apply the general features of that category okay which one the banks and raise direct by selling stocks yeah, this is a loser. This is a loose definition. That's why I wanted to amend this definition. Okay, I was just checking the notes. I, this is actually a loose definition. Some people refer to it this way, but you need to be aware that uh, because the classic. That's why I'm using the word classical as well, because the classical form of financial intermediation. Remember, which type of finance emerges earlier in an economy? Direct or indirect? Indirect. Indirect. indirect okay, so the banking function uh, is is pretty old. And so this typically, so the classical form of inter, uh, financial intermediation is the bank finance fun function. And therefore, when the classical form of financial disintermediation will happen when you're selling things like commercial paper, basically shutting the banks out from their bread and butter business of short term finance. Okay, this is a, let's call it a loose definition. We can just write it off. I'm not going to write perfect English here. Bread, bread, butter business. Okay. Deprive of short term finance. Sell commercial paper directly in cap capital markets okay so we can use this discussion of theoretical uh, you know categories to once again recap why you will find this error in many books on finance okay and these are supposed uh, these are like uh, often provided as textbooks in many other institutes okay you will find that why did I remember I, t uh, I told you a couple of sessions ago that this classification of uh, uh, debt markets into money markets and cap some of the books you'll notice they say that debt markets are divided into money markets and capital markets Okay, why is that wrong? I remember, I think I told you this before. Do you remember? Let me just go back to if I have a calc file for you guys here. Do I have a calc file? Or otherwise, I'll use the IFM calc file and change it later. No, there's no calc file here. So let me just use the IFM calc file. Um, Okay, I'll just do it here and I'll just la later on, I'll, I'll do it. Um, okay, let me just do it here. So, the uh, the uh, in many books, you'll find this. Um, where is the coloring function? Okay, never mind. Okay. Um, all right, so this if this is capital markets, many books will say that... Um,
okay so many books give you this kind of classification this classification is not correct okay why is it not correct okay so uh, they will define you know uh, bond markets this way okay or debt markets like this they will define debt markets like this if you put it this way and center it and where is the merging button all right so they will define debt debt markets they'll classify debt markets as money markets and capital markets why is it you see this in many books okay why is this wrong i gave i think i i'm not sure if i mentioned this to you but why is this wrong sorry my question is if you classify debt markets like this money markets and capital markets why is this wrong a wrong classification why is this a problematic classification because okay let me just quickly do this because anyway this is just my view but uh, you hopefully you'll see the logic in this so if we classify all the students in the school uh, into boys and girls then is it safe to assume that the boys are not girls and the girls are not boys that they're mutually exclusive remember one of the rules of taxonomy is the category should be mutually exclusive okay what happened sushant why have you not come to the front bench why have you not come to the front bench i'm going to deduct marks for you because this is not correct i mean i'm <laughs> really, then you should have told me that earlier i'm not no 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 i'm not interested you you don't have a choice as to where you are going to sit you're going to sit where i'm asking you to sit i'm coming no you can come now but you haven't come before so i mean when i gave you the instruction i'm going to charge you minus 2 and now where is he which group then i'm going to charge you for the money no this is what is meant by a group when you go and work in remember this one minute on the point one minute on the point that uh, so if you don't come now i'll deduct another minus 2 at the end of the class okay so one minute the point raised by kriti please remember okay uh, the point raised by kriti uh one of the things that people expect from mbas okay remember when you're going in as an mba one of the things that people expect is that you have the ability to work in teams okay please remember that because you when you are going in as an mba you are not a, a a hardcore programmer or something like that remember many organizations like facebook now don't longer they don't care about mbas they care about what you what you can do they will hold a coding context contest and they will hire even people from a class 12 they'll hire them directly okay because they don't care about whether you have a degree hanging around your neck if you are a good coder they'll hire you straight but you are not since you've chosen to do an mba you're not qualifying yourself as a technical person like an engineer or something like that okay so you have to remember that you better be good at what people expect from mbas one of the things they expect is good communication skills okay good uh, strategic ability the ability to look at business problems from a holistic point of view different functional areas combining different functional areas and the other thing that they will expect from mbas is the ability to work in teams and in this globalized world it becomes more and more working in cross cultural teams okay so be aware of all these things that if you are going to go and go into the world and market yourself as an mba okay you better be aware of what people expect from mbas and you better be good at that okay so you see there's a interesting case study on uh, on zara zara how zara is well known for being able to push their products into the market with new designs very fast their turnaround times are very fast and they have uh, very, there was a i was reading an interesting story on how they have all these different teams from all over the world working on the uh, on, on the designs okay and how they get that together so this is an aspect of cross cultural uh, working in cross cultural groups you guys are doing courses on cross cultural communication okay so please be aware kriti okay so your that's what's meant by team working in teams okay minus two. minus 2 no he's come now so he's okay okay it was already minus 2 yes. okay okay good very good all right okay okay now let me just quickly go into the uh, let me not waste by too much time on this because this is just my view so obviously any taxonomy automatically implies that the taxa or the categories are mutually exclusive okay so therefore what if you are saying money markets and capital markets that means you are saying one of the things you are saying is that money markets are not capital markets is that a fair assumption yes, yes okay now is it fair to say that any market where you can raise capital is a capital market yes 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 
Sahil doesn't agree. We agreed. Remember at the very beginning, one of the ways you see that I'm giving you all the theoretical uh, uh, constructs is that we are using what is called the plain meaning rule of interpretation in the sense that whatever, if it's a capital market, it should be, a, if it's a sugar market, it's a market for buying and selling sugar. So therefore, a capital market should be a market for buying and selling capital securities. Okay. That is you issue capital and you then uh, you, you, you uh, provide capital as the investor and the uh, uh, capital raising entity will provide a capital security like equity or debt as a certificate that you've given me this money. Yes. Is that correct? So a capital market, is it fair to say using the plain meaning rule of interpretation? Okay. That a capital market should be a market where you can raise capital by uh, selling capital securities. Okay. Is this clear? Okay. So normally in the market and in industry, you can just use the term securities because the classical meaning of securities refers to only equity and debt. Okay. So, so therefore I've made two, uh, two steps. First, I've said that if you are classifying things into money markets and capital markets, then uh, you're obviously saying that money markets are not capital markets. Okay. Second step of the logic is any market where you can raise capital is a capital market. Okay. All right. Now, did we just discuss some type of instrument which is issued in the money market? Commercial paper. Commercial paper. So is it fair to say that commercial pap paper is a capital uh, security? No. What are the two types of capital? Debt and equity. Okay. There's actually technically a third type also hybrids, but uh, we will just say debt and equity. Okay. Uh, because the some of the hybrid uh, type of bonds will be sold in the DCM uh, uh, in, in the DCM component and some will be sold by the ECM preference shares preference shares are technically a hybrid uh, security they are not really equity okay so they are technically but preference shares would be sold by the ECM team okay there are certain types of bonds like co contingent convertible bonds etc which are actually hybrid they are not really debt securities but they would also be sold by the DCM team Okay, so let's keep the broad classification for now debt and equity to solve this particular thing. So is it fair to say that, uh, so you know that commercial paper is a money market instru uh, instrument? Okay, now is it fair to say that commercial paper is a capital security? No. No? Who is saying no? Gaba. No, you should feel free to say no. I, you don't have to agree with me. That, that is more important that if you have any kind of doubt, you should uh, immediately uh, complain. Yes. So why are you saying I'm saying that commercial paper is a capital security because it's a security issued to raise capital because here you have to agree that debt and equity are both forms of capital. If you think that only equity is capital, then of course your objection is correct. But is it more general? I mean, is it more generally accepted? Uh, is it the more generally accepted view that both debt and equity are forms of capital? Right. Okay. You agree with me so far? So if you if you accept that both debt and equity are forms of capital, then you will agree that cap commercial paper is what debt or equity? Debt. 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 Okay, it's a debt instrument. Okay. So now do you agree? Don't agree because I'm like shouting at you. Yeah. So if you agree that both debt and equity are forms of capital, then you will agree that commercial paper is a uh, capital security. Okay. So it is used to raise capital because it's used to raise debt capital. Okay. That will go into the debt side of the uh, debt category in the balance sheet. Okay. So now if I have used a money market instrument uh, called commercial paper to raise capital, then does that not undermine this classification of money markets and classic capital markets? If I'm raising capital through the money markets, then, and if I say that capital, uh, any market where you can raise capital is a capital market then does it not undermine this classification? Yes. yes sir. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show you. So this is just my view, but it rehashes your concepts of commercial paper, money markets, debt markets, all these things, right? Okay. So, so if we, uh, don't say debt in capital, uh, as a capital, then we can classify this. Yeah. If you say debt is not a form of capital, then you can do that. Yeah. So his point is, this is also correct. That this is also good that you're also, while you're making a particular set of statements, you're also uh, identifying the assumption. Uh, which if that assumption doesn't hold then those statements will no longer be valid So that's what he just pointed out that if you say that debt is not a form of capital then this will be a problem Okay, so let me see what let me just uh, once again do what I'll just put this into I'll create a new sheet for you guys Let me just quickly run through the I don't think I've covered the concept of hybrid capital with you guys Okay, so while we are on this top topic, let's cover it quickly. Okay, so on the point of banks and capital raising Sorry 
No, commercial paper is not typically not issued for more than one year. It is a money market instrument. It is typically issued as a, at a discount and it is up for a less than typically it is six months. I think if you check the US, if you go and do research on the US CP market, you'll find most of the CP is three months, six months. Okay, because it is rolling short term finance. Okay, it is a perfect substitute for bank finance. Okay, because it matches the operating cycle of most companies. Okay, with this three month, six month, nine month kind of cycle, because you're selling your products, your receivables are coming through in, into cash. Then you can retire the CP and then you have rolling CP. So most companies have most large corporations will have rolling CP. They'll have CP programs. Okay. So in the Euro markets, uh, we will not have time to discover to uh, study the Euro markets. So in the Euro markets, you'll find many companies having uh, issue. Uh, they're coming up with Euro commercial paper programs. So the commercial paper issuance typically happens in the in large companies in the form through a program. That means you have an umbrella program. It's a Euro commercial paper program. And under that program, you are because it's all short term. So you keep on rolling the CP uh, outstandings. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes up, but you'll have an overall program with a limit of maybe, you know, $100 billion or something like that. And then you, the issuance under that program will stay up. It has to stay below 100 billion, but it'll keep fluctuating, uh, you know, depending on how you need financing and all that. That's how it typically works. Okay. Sir, are commercial paper tradable? Commercial paper is tradable. Not in India because India is not very liquid. Like but commercial paper, commercial papers aren't tradable, uh, like yeah, it depends on how you have structured the uh, the agreement with the lender. Okay, it depends on how you structured, but you can have actually you do have some amount of trading in CP. The banks will have CP trading desks. The bank money market. If you look at a big bank, if you look at a big money center bank, uh, their money market desk. The money market desk will be trading and they'll be trading first of all they'll be trading in what we call call money markets here okay that is the reserve funds the market for reserve funds borrowing and lending between the banks okay that's one big activity in money market on the money market desk then they'll have all kinds of other deposit activity okay trading in deposits and forwards and swaps and stuff like that and then one of the things they could also do is trade in cp because that's a money market instrument okay so that depends on the structure of the agreement with your uh, the issuer of cp Okay, so okay, you can see how long it's taking to load. Yeah, we are also trading in CP. Yes, yes. Like uh, Sushan just did a trade in CP. He saved two points by moving forward. Okay. Now, what was I going to do? Okay. So while discussing this point, let me just go back to the point that I discussed with these guys in your junior batch. Um, that class was that was in November 18 okay let me just so I'll later on I'll paste the sheet into you into your um, calc file I'll create a calc file for you guys this is your junior batch lab and then I will um, so what we are going to discuss now is just a little bit of a further expansion of the the refinement of this idea that the two forms of capital are debt and equity okay and as i explained to you you still don't have within an investment bank uh, primary capital markets operation you are still not going to have a group which is going to deal with hybrid capital markets okay it is still dcm and ecm so preference shares being a hybrid security will still be sold by the ecm group okay but we still should have some understanding especially because i've given a example of a new term, new type of debt security which has come up in the last two three years uh, which is a contingent convertible bond. These are called cocoa bonds. Okay. So, so contingent convertible bonds, you should be aware of this, that there is a, obviously preference shares, you know, preference shares is an example of uh, what we call a uh, hybrid security. It is not actually equity and it is not uh, debt. So it's kind of, it, that's why strictly speaking, it's a hybrid security. So I'll just show you the structure of the balance sheet once again. And uh, this was discussed in the Solomon case. You remember the Solomon case now? Yes. No, you forgot it. There was a company. Okay. Yeah, so what is okay? Let's recap this. This is such an important case in company law, probably the most important case in company law because your retention has been generally so poor. Let me test this. So what is the ratio of the Solomon case? You've forgotten what ratio decidendi is. 
One minute. One minute. One minute. We can't have so many answers. Give them the mic. Give the mic to Pallavi. Where's the mic? Move it. Move it fast. Give the mic. Get the mic uh, relayed to her fast. Like a four by one hundred relay team. Yeah. Yeah. Mic. Use the mic. So my question is, what is the ratio of this? Uh, you've forgotten what ratio decil ND is. Yeah. What is it? What is it? Yes, uh, Pallavi. No uplifting. So in the Solomon case, first of all, don't use the word uplifting, either lifting or not lifting. Okay. So you said you said the, your view is that in the Solomon case, the corporate veil was lifted. Okay. Anybody else with a different view? Kriti, yes. The company and the uh, individual identity are different. That like the Solomon and the Solomon and company are separate identities. Okay. And so according to you on the question of the lifting of the corporate veil, do you agree with uh, Pallavi or do you disagree? Was it lifted or was it not lifted? It was lifted. It was lifted. Okay. Anybody else want to comment? Sahil, you wanted to say something? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? We're not going to spend too much time. Okay. So uh, Kriti is correct uh, in what he said. Okay, uh, and what, what she said on her own that in uh, the what the Solomon case lays down the ratio of the Solomon case is that the company uh, by default the courts will treat will honor the corporate veil will not lift the corporate veil that is they will treat by default they will treat the company and the com uh, and the shareholders as separate legal entities. Okay, so the default action of the court is not to raise the corporate veil not to lift the corporate veil if you want the corporate veil to be lifted you have to provide good reasons for doing it okay good reasons as to why it should be done okay so the ratio the, your answer is not correct the ratio in the solomon case the corporate veil was not lifted because they sought to make they sought to make solomon liable for the uh, li uh, the liabilities of the uh, unsecured creditors okay so therefore um, uh, and and uh, the court refused to do that because the court said that the company was properly incorporated there is no fraud involved okay so remember that this is the default uh, this is the default uh, perspective of the court okay so in cases like the sahara case where why is subrata roy in jail technically he shouldn't be in jail because that is the whatever was done was done by sahara the company okay it was not done by him as a shareholder but because there is malfeasance there is fraud Okay, because the corporate entity was used to commit fraud and malfeasance, and he's actually technically in jail because he's uh, he disobeyed the orders of the Supreme Court to pay money. Okay, he's jail in jail for contempt of court. But the point that they, the reason they went after him in the first place is that if you use the corporate veil to commit fraud or you know engage in malfeasance, then the veil will be lifted. Okay, so this is the point. Okay, so hierarchy of claims. You remember this term? Did we go through this term in Solomon? We went through this term. Okay, so hierarchy of claims just shows you who gets to eat first. Yes. Okay. The senior debt holders get to eat first. Then preference shareholders. Yeah. No, not preference shareholders after that. <laughs> then subordinate debt. Okay. So, uh, so the point is basically hierarchy of claims. Remember this term. This is technical jargon from theoretical finance. You should remember this term. Hierarchy of claims. Claims on the revenues of the firm. As the firm is earning revenues, all those people who have provided capital to the firm have lined up waiting to be paid okay so there's a hierarchy for claiming these revenues and this is the hierarchy senior debt holders get paid first okay then you have subordinated debt holders okay and so there is this point of so remember one thing another thing that we learned in lab which you should recap because now you're dealing with things like ifm fdrm raising of capital should be very important especially for those who are going into banking or analyzing uh, companies okay there is the seniority of the debt and the secure whether or not the debt is secured are two different uh, 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 aspects of the debt so the point i'm trying to emphasize here is that the seniority of the debt and the collateralization of the debt are two different aspects are you following yes, so whether or not it, if a debt is secured we say it's collateralized okay so whether or not it's secured is uh, dealing with the question of collateralization of the debt is the debt collateralized or not so the collateralization of the debt is a separate matter from the seniority of the debt. Okay, the perfect example is the global financial crisis, where, as you know, a lot of residential mortgage-backed securities uh, <coughs> defaulted. Okay, because the housing bubble popped and the house prices started for crashing. 
and uh, people were defaulting on their loans so the rm the residential mortgage backed security started defaulting now in those rmbs all of those rmbs's were secured but there was a hierarchy of claiming are you following okay that's why the higher tranches were rated triple a those which had had more seniority everything just imagine this, this is a residential mortgage backed security which means it's a debt security and it is secured by residential mortgages okay so if Tushan doesn't pay his mortgage payments then Bittal also doesn't pay then eventually those uh, uh, defaults will start hitting the pre repayments on the bonds okay so therefore those residential mortgage backed securities will start defaulting okay so who gets the all us everything is secured by mortgages but there is a seniority so the senior tranches get the most protection they get hit last by the defaults and the junior tranches get hit first okay so understand that uh, seniority of debt is a separate aspect of the debt from the collateralization of the debt is this point clear has everybody understood the statement yes sir. okay all right so senior debt subordinated debt now here you have technically hybrid securities either preferred stock okay or uh, what is called deeply subordinated debt okay uh, other forms of deeply subordinated debt and one example i've given you here which i'll paste into your notes is coco bonds coco stands for contingent convertible okay you can read up on coco bonds here okay this is a new development in the eurozone okay some banks like deutsche bank has issued some coco bonds okay essentially what happens in these bonds is that if there is any kind of financial distress on sir based on certain trigger events the principal can vaporize so your entire principle just vaporizes so then it starts behaving like equity because equity can vaporize you can't complain if equity vaporizes you have no right to complain because you knew that it could vaporize but you bought it okay so it therefore becomes it gets issued as a bond with coupon payments but if there is a certain trigger event which happens which relates to financial distress then the equity the principle the entire principle can vaporize okay so therefore uh, or parts of it can vaporize so it starts behaving like equity so that's a hybrid security so it's a new learning that you can have here which is coco bonds and uh, preferred stock and then obviously after that this preferred stock should not be here um all right and then you have common stock which is of course the riskiest form of capital okay all right so we learned something new about the hybrid security and also about the we rehashed this idea of seniority of debt versus collateralization of debt so all of this is related to our discussion of um, expanding on this definition of financial disintermediation okay all right and then we also had this uh, discussion on the uh, classification okay why it's not correct to say that the classification is money markets and capital markets because you can sell capital securities on uh, in the money markets okay so let's go back to uh, this coverage here what are the next item we are going to cover no not TWS that Ayush hasn't logged in yet <laughs> he's taking a long time to log in <laughs> this is, I don't know why it's taking so long now it's coming it's uh, just requesting startup parameters took a very long time okay maybe because I don't know what the signal gets affected here in the classroom or not whatever what I, okay so in this we have covered asset managers I went back and covered uh, financial disintermediation a little bit okay now we will look at uh, the next category market makers we have already looked at remember we already looked at market makers when I was discussing investment banks because I said that to be a, a fairly large invest in order to be become uh, successful as an investment bank typically you will have to add the secondary capital markets capability okay the purest form of investment banking the purest investment banking function is just the primary capital markets part okay you can have investment banks small boutique investment banks who do only the primary capital markets part they don't even have the secondary capital markets capability but typically in many cases what will happen is investors will say that uh, I'll, I'm fine with buying these shares of Alibaba but if I want to trade in them later on will you provide market making uh, facility I mean will you provide a market making function for these shares okay and a market making function in uh, securities will become essentially a what secondary capital markets operation is this clear so once again using this language uh, which we used yesterday a secondary capital markets operation is a species of ma uh, market making operation is this clear because market making can happen in 
other asset classes as well I've got too many tabs open everywhere let's try still so a security a secondary SCM let's just call it SCM SCM unit is a species of market making operation does everyone understand this term yes, sir. okay Sonam and Himani will also lose points they are engaged in their own conversation Sonam is conducting her own <laughs> class and student Himani is a student <laughs> where is this now which group is this <laughs> So even before Sena has also opened his account. Okay, good. Now, where were we? Okay, we were actually here. Right. So we were saying that uh, SCM uh, uh, SCM unit is a species of money market making operation. Does the sentence make sense to everybody? Yes, sir. Clear? Kalra? You're clear about the sentence? No. <laughs> then why are you sitting quiet? So tell me now if it's SCM is a species of market making operation, which of these asset classes that you see, we have listed five major asset classes here. An SCM unit is to is likely to operate in which asset classes am out of this list from this list? Is my question clear? Yes, yes, sir. An SCM unit is going to operate in which two uh, which two asset classes out of this? Equities and debt. 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 That's not. I'm asking Kalra. Somebody else is answering. Okay. So this is clear to everybody. That is why. And now you understand. That, I mean, I'm, I'm repeating this species and genus kind of structure, but I think it's important for structuring out your way of thinking. Okay. The reason I say that an SCM unit is a species of market making operation is because you can have market making operations and currencies and commodities as well, yes. but they would not be SCM units. An SCM unit has to operate only in debt and equity. Is this clear? Okay. So therefore another statement you can make whenever you have these as species genus structures is what else can we say? Uh, all all dash are dash all dash are dash but all dash are not dash yeah. that structure remember <laughs> so um, <laughs> if i one minute one minute we are going to test it keshav is going to help us now we just made this statement one sec we just made this statement that scm units are a species of market making operation is this clear Okay, now on the back of that statement, assuming that statement to be true, you make a statement with this kind of structure. All dash are dash, but all dash are not dash. One minute. Not not you, Sina. Let Keshav answer. Is my question clear? Yes, sir. Everyone has understood my question? Yeah, fill in the blanks question. Yes, Keshav? Give him the mic. You want to answer? You don't want to answer? Okay, Sina, let's give it to Sina. One minute. Where is the mic? Where is the mic? Give it to Sena quickly. Yes. All SC, uh, an SCM unit is a species of market making operation. Now quickly make a statement of the structure that I just gave you. What happened? Anybody else wants to try? Who? Him? Uh, Mansi will try? Okay. One minute. No, no, no. Let's go. Since Mike, Mansi has the mic, let her try. Secondary capital market units. Be quiet here, guys. Market making operations, but all market making operations are not SCM units. Very good, excellent. Has everyone got that? Yes. Okay, so that's what we are just. I'm rehashing this maybe a bit uh, too many times. <laughs> what CP points here? No, no, but this is actually uh, you have understood and accepted that 
this is not point based CP. This is CP for the sake of CP. So in fact, I've always, whenever I try to agitate with uh, DG sir, that we should remove the CP uh, requirement yes, because it uh, means that I can cover less material. Okay. Yes, so therefore, or what I always tell him is that even when we don't have CP marks, people still participate. Yes, sir. Because the point of giving marks for CP was to encourage people to participate. So, but I feel that in many, uh, what I see, in, uh, people still participate anyway. So Whether you have, you sorry? You no, I'm not allowed to. No, he said minimum 20%. He has made a rule that CP has to be minimum 20%. So, I'm not allowed to. Okay, let's have this display going. Okay, all right, guys. Now, what we want to do, now this is Ayush's account. Okay, what we are going to do is, uh, can I assume, uh, Nakwal, may I assume that in your team, Ayusha's account has already been uh, corrupted by practice trading. Yes. We can assume that. You have maintained one account as pure, which is to be used for project trading. Is that clear? Is that okay? Okay. This is, we are talking non NSE. Okay. To be on the safe side, let me see if there's anything in the trade log. There's nothing. Okay. To be on the safe side, I'm not going to corrupt this. Okay. Now, guys, please be clear. What you have to do is, uh, you have to make sure that. Uh, Take up. I'm going to give you Facebook anyway as a set up Facebook. So I'm just interrupting the flow of the theoretical material to just make sure that I. Um, okay, so Facebook is not going to be trading now because it'll open at 8 p.m. So we don't have that. But what we want to test is, let's test this, okay? Uh, so you have, the, these are the closing prices. The spread offer spread is quite wide, okay? Now, uh, let's do one thing here. Let's look at, um, let's test something here. What I want to test is, uh, it should be, uh, now this is the problem. See, this is what I don't want to see. That if we are getting delayed data on crude oil, that means we have a problem in this account. These accounts need to be refreshed. And if Ayush is have, facing the problem, that means pretty much everybody is going to face this problem. But we can use Google, Google Finance. Google Finance is, I need you to trade in TWS so that I can have the account data, the NLV, NLV data. So I need to audit. Sorry? You need to use TWS to trade. You cannot just trade using. And this is, you are going to be trading one minute. You are going to be trading options. Okay. So let me just show you what else has to be set up. Once. So this is all delayed data. This is the problem. All delayed data. So, okay. Guys, now what you're going to do is it's delayed data, but let's, let me show you what you're going to do. Okay. <laughs> You right click on it one minute once we fix it once we fix it i'm going to talk to her and get that uh, get her to refresh the accounts okay now one minute once we fix it you will set up so i'll let me go back here okay so i'm going to give you a bunch of tickers okay a bunch of stocks that you'll have to trade so let's say amazon is one of those um, uh, let me just press insert here okay so say amazon is one of the tickers so you'll go and have you'll have to go and enter amazon here okay and you can just enter so you saw what i did it'll give you uh, various options you got to choose stock smart smart is the smart routing of uh, that's a ib ib uh, you know a product i mean their ip particular uh, uh, ip that they have in that they uh, route it to optimally to any of the uh, different uh, to to, to to any of the different venues that are available okay so here you see amazon here what you have to do is you have to right click go to uh trading tools is one one way you can do it then open option trader so what you're going to do is i'm going to show you for one particular stock but you'll have to do this for all the stocks that are given to you as a universe okay okay that's fine this we don't need again all right now this actually what has happened is i have made the fonts um, the fonts are very big okay all right okay so what you'll see is let me try and reduce the buttons okay so what you're going to see here is the objective of trading here is we'll show you let me close this daily lineup sheet all right 
okay so you have various options here but i'm just going to show you the basic option it keeps disappearing okay all right never mind nothing is visible because i've made the font size so big so anyway you have to get used to this is uh, this is basically the bid and offer for calls and puts okay and you have um, the tab view is better actually okay um, it's so big that um, we can't see everything option okay so you have to basically uh, let's do one thing let's just go and test one thing when when you when you when i give you the go ahead to test you just test for we can if you get it on this you'll get it on the options you will go and try uh, see there's a bid offer here you can't see the thing because it's too big uh, the font is too big so you'll see a bid ask okay you just try to buy any option and see whether you get any kind of uh, information on delayed data etc okay here you will get um, some kind of message on delayed data i think the computer is slow or you test it even on the stocks test it even on the stocks okay just try to buy or sell any of the stocks in us time okay so make sure the us market is us time should be more than 9:30 between 9:30 and 4 okay us time that is and us time is there are four different versions of us time so you have to choose what is called eastern time take the time in new york take the time in new york or philadelphia or any of those east coast cities huh new york and washington yeah new york washington boston uh, any of those east coast cities eastern eastern standard time est okay just take the time in new york okay sorry 9:30 to 4 okay so you new york time see this is now it's very uh, slow so if just see if this that's okay just is very slow actually it's not loading properly so just try to transmit this order and see if you get this message saying that you are trading this is a normal message that you will get if there is a problem is you are trying to trade in a market where you have only delayed data okay this is very risky etc so this message you should not get so when i give you the go ahead to test go and test it by setting up the tickers okay and ticker setting up you already know how to do it you've done it in nse you know how to set up the tickers okay so are you guys finding these uh, projects useful or not yes are they useful okay now aryan is not convinced pallavi also <laughs> expression is not very uh, affirmative so anyway but uh, we have to do it because this is just my view of how uh, you know it should be taught because you need to be given the exposure to uh, the first hand exposure to ma how markets actually move and hopefully this will help you to see you guys remember you've done stuff like this harry markowitz uh, efficient frontier and all this stuff mm-hmm. bell is looking at me like i'm some zombie or something <laughs> you haven't done risk return <coughs> portfolio of markowitz <laughs> so you've forgotten harry markowitz's name <laughs> okay one minute <laughs> Harry Markowitz portfolio construction. Okay, fine. That's risk return as uh, mean return and standard deviation as the risk of return. Optimal portfolio, optimal fr- fr- efficient frontier. All that stuff you've done. Okay, but hopefully one of the things that you learn is see, see Harry Markowitz. Harry Markowitz is is, is a pure academic. Okay, so hopefully one of the things you'll recognize. One minute, please be quiet. hopefully one of the things you'll recognize because you have to go out and actually practice in the world of finance one of the things you'll realize hopefully is that after doing all these projects and seeing first hand how market prices move what is the level of uncertainty and the unpredictability of markets okay um even when you're looking at the performance of experts one of the things you'll realize is how impractical these kinds of frameworks are that this notion that you're going to sit together at the beginning of a period and classify this you're going to say that okay facebook is going to have uh you know mean return of 15% and standard deviation of 6% if you think about it these are actually uh, in real life you you don't operate like this because if you are you able to follow what i'm saying one of the things this uh, uh, the response is not sufficiently convincing <laughs> maybe you guys are just tired or whatever 
but the point is that the point of doing all this and understanding looking at how market prices actually move is to understand how impractical many of the theoretical frameworks that are taught in, in classical finance courses are because if you look at this Markowitz portfolio construction business okay mean the standard deviation it means you have to look at a potential portfolio of let's say 45 50 stocks you have to project the mean return and the standard deviation of the return typically for a longer period longer period like one year or something like that can you imagine how uh, ridiculous that exercise is because it may, it has no meaning you make a prediction today tomorrow something happens and everything changes so in fact how you have to approach things is that you have to take it on a day-to-day -day basis you take a short-term estimate today you make a take a view on something but then very soon you find that it's not working out and you have to take additional steps to mitigate the risk either you cut it or you whatever you want to do okay so are you following what i'm trying to say yes so hopefully when you're looking at all these uh, market movements you'll get to see how impractical many of these theoretical contra constructs are mm. in real life you can't operate like that because everything is i mean many of these theoretical constructs don't have any they don't show any appreciation for the level of unpredictability that exists in the financial markets that is something that one of the way one of the reasons for making you do these things to give you is to give you a first-hand sense of how unpredictable things really are and how you therefore have to uh, tailor your approach to that kind and you can you can't do anything about that unpredictably not no matter how much uh, predictive modeling you do there's nothing you can really do about the fact that it remains fundamentally unpredictable just like life itself is unpredictable okay anybody even a multi-billionaire can die tomorrow in a, a jet accident right so nobody's life is guaranteed nothing is guaranteed okay so life itself is unpredictable and so are the markets so this is an important lesson that you should learn from doing all these uh, things. So don't get fooled by uh, theories and uh, structures and models which tell you that, okay, we are predicting this. This is not physics. Okay, in physics, we can predict the path of the Mars rover all the way to Mars. Okay, we can make it land there and stuff like that. Because that is uh, those are stable systems. Markets, economies and life itself is not stable. So you have to understand these things. Uh, this is one of the things that you should understand from doing these uh, projects and seeing how market prices actually move am i making sense yes sir hmm. okay some people have <laughs> Sina is, uh, but Sina is making Sina is making up for the lack of enthusiasm in the rest of the class so all right i don't know what is happening here my maybe my pc is freezing up uh, i know now everything is um, i can't even see anything okay i'll let you guys go then so some people who are already sleeping like double a Dina is sleeping double a Chabra is also sleeping <laughs> leaning back <laughs> so who is next to Dina? she is also sleeping <laughs> Her, Parmeet is also sleeping I <laughs> <laughs>